Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show where we talk with accomplished chess players, authors, and personalities about their lives, their careers, and how to improve at chess. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters and by Chessable.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have a guest of great honor who I've long wanted to interview once again joining us this week. He is a chess writer, editor, commentator, and organizer. He has even been the captain of the Dutch uh, Chess Olympiad team. Uh, But of course, he is best known as the editor-in-chief of New in Chess magazine, which is the industry standard chess magazine with uh, beautiful glossy pictures and incredible grandmaster analysis and great on-the-scenes reporting back when you could go on the scenes of chess tournaments, which we hope will be resuming pretty soon. He has been immersed in chess since he joined New in Chess in 1985, um, written about and interviewed and spent time with virtually every top chess player. Uh, He's written many books. Uh, His most recent, I believe, was a second edition of 2015's Finding Bobby Fischer, which is a great interview compilation. So if you're listening to this, you probably enjoy chess interviews. You might enjoy these compilations. And of course, I hope a lot of you are already subscribed to New in Chess Magazine. But if you're not, we'll give you a feel for what it's about. So without further ado, let's bring in Dirk Jan Ten Guzendam. Uh, Dirk Jan, thank you for joining us. Thank you, uh, Ben, for the uh, for the invite. It's a pleasure. So, so Dirk, you've been covering, obviously, chess during the pandemic. I know it's a challenge. I'm friendly with John Hartman, the editor of Chess Life magazine. Um, but And it was a theme as we record. I just got the digital edition of the latest issue, which features uh, you had an interview with uh, young Finam, Grandmaster Ali Reza Faruja. Of course, you you write a little bit about the Queen's Gambit. You cover the Skilling Open, the U.S. Championships. You always have Matthew Sadler's book review, which is a favorite feature of mine. I also like the checking in feature on the back cover. So you've got a lot of sort of... um, that should give listeners a taste of what you guys write about. Um, how is how is the pandemic treating New in Chess magazine? Because there's a lot of cross currents from my perspective in that there's not live chess to cover. Chess is booming, but print magazine generally, you could say, is kind of in a bear market. Um, so how does all this shake out when evaluating New in Chess magazine? Well, I feel look back at the past six or eight months in fact uh, it's been treating us fairly well and uh, we've we've been doing fine uh maybe slightly to our amazement but uh, but i think that it is true that at the moment there is a a chess boom going on uh despite the pandemic and uh obviously we had to resort resort to other uh tournament reports than we were used to because uh, most of the tournaments moved online or new, new ones um, appeared online. Uh, so we did that. and uh, But in between there was, um, well, we were very happy that there was Norway chess where there was where people were sitting at the board again. There were some other events. And uh, let's say <laughs> ideally, but that probably goes for the entire world, uh, it would be good for us if at some point people returned to the board again. Um, But uh, for the rest, um, I must say that it has affected us much less than I had feared. So, um, uh, well, what what you can see is that there is is, uh, a loss in quality in in, in many of the online tournaments. Uh, But still, if you pick out the best, then there's still a lot of good chess. So, uh, and there's only so much that we can cover anyway. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy about the standard that we managed to keep uh, over the past months, uh, but I'm also looking forward to, uh, to real tournaments again, but I think that goes for all of us. Uh, while at the same time, it's great that these new initiatives uh, appeared and uh, we've, we've seen many great events uh, there and it's, it's, it's great that there's a next uh, Magnus Carlsen tour and uh, which will go on for a year. Um, but yeah, I would definitely, uh, root for a, a mix of, uh, uh, in-person tournaments and uh, online tournaments. Yeah. In the magazine, in the most, the most recent issue, I know that both Grandmaster Wesley So 
who uh, wrote about his recent tournament experiences and in your interview with GM Ali Reza Faruja, both players talked about missing the feel of the pieces. So I know that we as chess fans and reporters um, miss the real thing, but it was nice to, to, to sense that sort of palpable um, feeling from even the top players. Oh, yes, yes. Everyone I spoke to who had been in, in, in Norway, they, they were so happy that they had been at the board again. And um, I think it's, it's well. It's easy to understand because it's 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 quite different. Uh, whether you're sitting opposite someone, you, uh, you you feel your opponent, you can observe your opponent. It's uh, yeah, it's totally different. And if, and is it a added challenge just to fill the magazine? I mean, obviously, people people like yourself have have written about and can write about chess, basically um, ad infinitum, but in particular, covering events, uh, is it hard to plan what to cover and what not to cover when there's this new online thing um, really growing rapidly? Well, I think there was more than enough for us to cover. Uh, we, you know, well, largely you stay away from the Blitz tournaments because there's um, not that many great games going on there. I mean, it's 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 something which is much which you can enjoy much better online uh, but for us there um, well as I said even in, in, in the rapid tournaments there have been many great games there have been classical tournaments it's uh, yeah on, on the whole I think it, it, it's 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 been no problem at all in fact but of course if, if it were to continue for a couple of more years then it would then it we would have to adapt but, uh, but I'm, I'm hopeful that we don't have to and you mentioned, of course, you, you're hoping for a role for, I mean, and there will be a role for classical chess, um, it, you know, once this pandemic is over. But what's your overall feeling? You know, Magnus Carlsen recently did an interview with uh, Grandmaster Jonathan Tisdall, which was reprinted in U.S. Chess Online, uh, where he, you know, and he's, he's alluded to this before, possibly even to you personally, he really envisions a, a strong move online for chess. He's not opposed to classical and real life chess, but he envisions this being a big part of the business model. And I think a lot of uh, um, older players and uh, players, I mean, he has a classical upbringing, but nonetheless, he seems to be pushing strongly for this. And obviously, um, with his business interests and just with his being um, the most prominent chess player in the world, he uh, has some sway. So wh what what do you think of all of this push? Well, obviously, he's, he's right that a, a bigger portion will go online. But I think for, uh, for, for many chess fans, it's still this possibility to see people sitting together and taking more time um, that keeps its appeal. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'd be surprised if that disappeared, but uh, of course it's not for me to, to decide. Maybe it's more for him to decide uh, because uh, he's, he's, he's way more influential there. But um, if, if I see how much more interest there is for classical tournaments in general and, and, and the appeal it has to larger base of chess fans, then I'd be very surprised if that disappeared. Uh, I, I mean, you, you, you could see how, well, I, I, as, as we, we both noted, how happy players were that they could uh, uh, gather again at a tournament and, and, and just play classical chess, or at least a, a relatively slow uh, time rate. Yeah, and and of course, you write about Queen's Gambit in the new issue, as, as I mentioned earlier. and. I think that one of the reasons that the show really has resonated with people is um, more so than any um, piece of chess film that I can remember. It really captures the mystique of OTB chess. Um, there's there's a balance because sometimes it's sort of uh, presented as dark and musty, you know, like when you see like the old Soviet footage of the championships and stuff like that. But they really uh, display it in a glamorous light. And I think that that's something that can be capitalized on once there there are live tournaments again. Well, I, I think you're absolutely right when you speak about mystique. I mean, it's this mystique, this romanticism that has uh, had so much appeal for chess through the ages. Uh, I mean, it's it's this uh, 
of this small miracle that is taking place. And I think if you exclusively replace that by by uh, fast tournaments, then uh, which are very hard to follow for uh, for most people, then uh, I mean it's 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 easier to follow a classical tournament uh, live because you have time to explain things. Uh, so in in that sense, it I. I I think that uh, there's more than enough people who uh, who want to keep that mystique and that uh, well that romantic feeling of, of of going to a chess tournament and uh, seeing slower games. Yeah. So and they're starting to happen a little bit right now, and of course we hope within the next six months things can start to resemble normal yeah. life. Well, um, it, it's 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 funny that people. I mean and. Often it's 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 chess players who say so that they say, well, uh, we are too slow and nobody's going to watch that. And I mean, there are so many sports that take hours or uh, many hours, and nobody. I mean, how, it, j just if you look at cycling, how boring is that? Well, it's not boring at all because people understand what's happening, and they sometimes they sit there watching it for four hours or five hours. I don't know. Uh, so it it just very much depends on how you present it and how you explain it. Uh, and yeah, essentially, I don't see any problems there. Yeah, well, I think we may disagree a little bit because at the margins, I do, I can only, like as a working dad, um, I, I can only watch so much chess a day, even as someone who loves it and uh, makes a living from the game. Um, but certainly, if there were five high-level class, I mean, uh, classical tournaments a year and the world championship remain classical, I would be happy with that. That, that. that sounds pretty good to me. And then you could sprinkle in plenty of rapid and blitz live events as well as online events on top of that. But you don't have to watch all the time. I mean, if, if, yeah. if, if a tournament is going on, you, you may have a peak at the start of the round. You may have in between. It's, it's, it's all up to you. And uh, I think that at the moment, the mix that we have, also including speed chess because obviously it's great to to watch speed chess for a couple of hours if you're in the mood why not i mean it's it's fantastic you see the best players play speed chess um so i think at the moment we are uh well if if the classical tournaments uh return to a certain extent then i think we're really spoiled for choice and that's great yeah, it is. And of course, not to mention just just the interest in playing that that obviously uh, Queen's Gambit. I mean, sure. You know, the fact of actually playing the game is just the, the primary appeal for so many people beyond just just watching. And it's, you know, online is certainly amazing for that. Although I know that chess clubs could help with uh, bring people into the world. Um, as as they they meet people and get to know the communities and stuff like that. Um, so I th one I more thing. On I think the development there is is is, is much stronger. Uh, I mean, it, it's become so easy to, uh, to 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 play chess because you you simply go online and, and there's so many uh, opportunities. So I, I think that definitely will uh, move online to a large extent. There's no question about that. Yeah, it's a, it's amazing to see, and it'll be interesting to see how many new online chess devotees try out tournaments. Um, so one more question on the new issue, Dirk, um, just out of curiosity, since I'm, I have to admit, a little bit jealous that you got to interview Grandmaster Ali Reza Perugia. So was there anything that surprised you from, from um, speaking or uh, emailing? I don't know how the interview was conducted uh, with him. No, not, not really. You know, I've, I've met him uh, at a couple of tournaments and he's, he's, he's a very uh, friendly and, and nice young man. And I, and I think we we're all very happy that he... Um, he is a or maybe the new face in, 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 in the world elite because his play is very enterprising. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to watch his games. So in, the, in that sense, um, yeah, we were very happy to, to, to have him. But on the other hand, you know, that he's a, well, he's, he's a very young person. Uh, they are in a slightly complicated situation by having left Iran and now settling in France. So you you know beforehand that there's all kinds of things they're not going to, he's not going to speak about. Right. So, and and that is fully understandable. Uh, so in, in, in that sense, it's, uh, I mean, as a, as a chess player, I think he's, he's fantastic. But uh, 
for a, a full-fledged interview is well, he's a bit he's a bit young. Yeah, of course. As you know, having done two hundred plus interviews for this podcast, I've certainly experienced that as well. Even even players, you know, not quite on the uh, trajectory of uh, Grandmaster Feruja, um, There's there's no substitute for life experience when it comes to um, to being interviewed and to just having having perspective for you know how amazing he is at chess. And as you say, his games are something to behold. So that's that's the most important thing. Um, and it'll be fun to track his career. Um, in the coming years. And it was it was nice to hear, you know, he's so good at blitz and bullet that the one thing that I was really happy to see from your interview with him is how excited he sounds to play classical chess again. Yeah. Well, one of the great things about Ali Reza is his, let's say, his, his freshness, which also adds to his playing style because there's, you get the feeling that he doesn't have certain fears that more experienced players have. And uh, that, well, that makes it a pleasure to watch his games. He's, you, yeah. know, you know, there's always going to happen something. Yeah, he seems to manage to impose his will on the positions. He he manages to get his kind of game um, at, at a, in a very a very high percentage of the time. Um, so Dirk, I uh, Dirk Jan, excuse me. Um, I'd like to. I know you've got so many stories. You've interviewed so many people. So uh, with the time we have, that's where I'd like to go next. But first, we're going to take a break and hear from our friends at Chessable. As always, Perpetual Chess is proud to be brought to you in part by Chessable.com. Chessable is a chess learning website that utilizes its move trainer technology to help you learn and remember opening lines, tactical patterns, and end games. It is endorsed by GM Magnus Carlsen and features courses from I am John Bartholomew, Sam Shanklin, Wesley So, and so many others. Chessable has over 100,000 members and features hundreds of courses, both for free and for purchase. So if you haven't checked it out yet, please go to chessable.com and take a look around. Back to the interview. So Dirk Jan, I was just reading before the interview, moments before uh, some of your compiled interviews in the book, The Day That Kasparov Quit. Um, and of course, Finding Bobby Fischer also has some, some great interviews in it. Um, both are available on Kindle, by the way, listeners. Um, and I, in the past, have mentioned on the show that I think of all the grandmasters of all time, who would be the best po- podcast guest? Of course, podcasts are kind of a very intimate uh, setting. You know, people are kind of whispering in your ear. So um, the more personable a guest is and the more frank they are, the, the better they tend to be as a guest. And I have posited before that maybe Grandmaster Miguel Nidorf would be the greatest perpetual chess guest uh, in chess history if you could take anyone. And in reading your interview with him, I was not disabused of that uh, theory. Is there? Do you agree with that? And is there anyone else who comes to mind for you as someone who would would be or would have been uh, an incredible guest on a chess interview podcast? Well, with Miguel Knight or a few, you, and by you, you definitely wouldn't have to be afraid of any silences because he, <laughs> he, he, he keeps talking and talking and he's, uh, well, the, the, the great thing about the interview that I did with him was that in fact, it was not just a, a sit down interview, but I spent a, a whole day with him in uh, Buenos Aires. And during that entire day, he just kept talking and talking and, and I was keeping, I mean, making notes uh, all the time. Uh, and it was, well, it, it was entertaining for the entire day uh, because he, the, the, the interesting thing with Nidorf was that he very much longed to be the center of the universe. And, you know, sometimes people, when they have that wish, uh, we, well, turn our backs on them because this is not what we want in a person. But with him, it was very much okay. Everyone loved that Don Miguel wanted to be the sun in our solar system. So whenever, whenever he came into a room, uh, I mean, it was just the, the, the sun su- uh, started shining. And you, you would accept from him things that you probably wouldn't accept from others because he was such a, such a force. Uh, and uh, I remember Fischiana at some point, he said we, we came to a tournament in, in Spain and everyone was a bit uh, tired from traveling and we're sitting in the lobby and everyone is thinking of going to sleep. And then suddenly, uh, Miguel Nidorf, he claps his hands and says, so where are the girls? <laughs> <laughs> and and, and that, was, that was him. I mean, he was, he was always full of life. And uh, I, I remember I, w- I was at a tournament in, in Dos Amanas, which was uh, 
couple of kilometers outside of Seville. And I had gone to the city and what I would do is, is, is buy a Herald Tribune there, then go to the hotel, have a coffee and, and enjoy my fresh and crisp uh, newspaper. And I walk in and I mean, and he's sitting at the bar and he says, oh, great, you got the Herald Tribune. Can you give it to me? And this is the last thing I want to give this <laughs> newspaper to anyone. Uh, but then, of course, it's him and he, yeah. it and he totally ruins it because he wants to check something. And and then we have a coffee together, and uh, and everyone is happy. I mean, he was, um, yeah, he, he was a fantastic guy. Yeah, and he was speaking very frankly about the the contemporary grandmasters of the time, uh, Gramnik and Kasparov, and uh, on the list goes. So definitely uh, recommend that interview. And and you mentioned that he was the oldest grandmaster in the world at the time of that interview. Yes, at that point he he was, and and he was he was a strong player. He. Um, uh, he would join. I mean, they would they would analyze games from the tournament. But when he came to visit, and he was he still saw such a such a lot. I mean, he really passionately loved the the, the game. He. I mean, th this was the introduction I had when I, I went up to him and I said, uh, Don Miguel, I, I heard that you go to play chess every day. Is that true? And he says, Yes, that's what I do. I go to, go to my club every day because I need it. Like. You need classical music. And then uh, I said, would you mind if I join you? And uh, he said, no, no, come to my office and we go. To... And and that's how I spent that entire day with him, going to the chess club, uh, going to some reception with the mayor and Judith Polgar. And and and, and he was always at the center of attention. And, uh, and everyone liked it. Yeah. And do you have any other experiences that, that come to mind that rival that one? Well, I, I think the... the the great thing with uh, with interviews that you, that you cherish are the ones where um, where it's not you just sitting down and, uh, and and talking for some to someone for half an hour or an hour, but where um, where you very much remember where you were or, or under which circumstances something um, took place, and uh, you had you had plenty of time. Uh, I think I was very fortunate that I spent an awful lot of time at chess tournaments, not just going there for a couple of hours a day, but just being there for one or two weeks and uh, having the time to um, well, to spend time normally with, with the players, get to use them, get to get used to them. And, uh, and then once the moment of the interview came, it would be a very natural thing. Uh, so... Um, so spending a day with someone, I mean, that, that's a privilege for someone who, who's doing an interview. Uh, I mean, I, another one that, that, um, that I'm very fond of is, is, is uh, uh, Bronstein, who I visited for three days at his home in, in, uh, in Moscow. And uh, yeah, just, just having so much time to, to, to interview him and, uh, and then write a story about it. I thought that that was total luxury, and and of course he was a very special person too. I mean, very uh, well, a br absolutely brilliant uh, chess player and uh, and a very special human being. Now I know that our Grandmaster Jenna Sasanko, of course, has written for New and Chess many times, and uh, your fellow Netherlands resident. He, of course, wrote a great book about Bronstein, but it wasn't um, didn't always cast him in the most positive light. You could say. Um, what, was that your experience as well in your three days with uh, Grandmaster Brownstein? Well, I, I think the way Gena wrote about him is is absolutely brilliant because let's say this is the this is the the way uh, Brunstein talked and he would go on and on and on. Um, but it's let's say it's one side of his his person, and you could uh, you could stop him. Uh, so that's what when it, during those three days I tried to stop him as much as possible, uh, so that be, because you knew that he could go out on 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 a rant about him, about all these things that he was obsessed about. But uh, I remember well we had agreed that well he he didn't want to give an interview, so I, I I told him I said well you don't have to give an interview, but I'll come to your home three times and we'll talk and I'll write about it and uh, <laughs> and you'll be unhappy. I mean, and uh, I knew him well enough to speak frankly about 
these uh, things. So the first day I come there, and it's 11 in the morning, and he's, he's very nervous and agitated, and he's walking around. And, um, and at some point I said, David, could you please sit down because you're, you're making me nervous? He says, yes, but I, I am nervous. I say, why are you nervous? He says, well, because you're going away. I say, I just arrived. <laughs> yes, but at some point you're going to go away. I said, of course I'm going away, but okay, let's make a deal. I won't leave before four. I will leave at four on the dot. Is that okay? Now please sit down. <laughs> and then he would sit down and we talk. And of course, at some point he, he gets agitated again. But he, yeah, he was a very kind person. And, and uh, I found it fascinating to see him also as a reflection of the Soviet times that he had lived through and all the things that he had done. And, and the way he looked at himself, I find fascinating that he could get very unhappy if people kept reminding him uh, of his uh, tournament book of Zurich uh, 53, which so many people kept saying was the best book of all time. And Yeah, he, he wouldn't like this podcast then because someone recommends it every week. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, but he was right. And he, then he would look at these people and he, and he would be... Well, actually, quite quite rude, and say, "Well, I, I hope. What what do you think that I didn't do anything else the, the next forty years? Or, uh, I mean, what have you done the past forty years? <laughs> if if you keep going on about something which happened forty years ago, fifty years ago, and um, and what I f- found interesting was that also he, uh, well, of course, he felt that he lacked recognition, and that the new stars they got paid better, so." Um, I mean that's fair, right? Yes, yes, but it's there. There was very little to be done about that, and and I would tell him. I said, "Listen, I had dinner with someone last night, and I and he said, what are you doing tomorrow?' He said, "I'm going to interview Bronstein." He couldn't believe his ears. He said, "That's my hero," <laughs> and then and then Bronstein said, "Yeah, but what's that to me? I don't know this person." Which also, <laughs> I thought, okay, fair enough, but he had all these small. Uh, touching things which I liked that he he was going uh, through his stuff and at some point he, he he says look at this look at this and he had ten drawings of Pushkin I say what do you want to tell me and he says well you know I I was at a at a market in Minsk where his then wife lived uh, Tatiana and he saw these drawings and he asked the the, the seller he said well uh, are they selling well and he said no nobody buys them. No. And then he says, but I, I find that so sad that our biggest poet, n- nobody was buying them. So I bought all of them. You want to have one? And I, said, and I said, yeah, but that's, that's touching. I mean, but that was, yeah. that was David Bronstein too. So, and, and he had these, all these observations. He would say, so what do you think if Kasparov plays E4 and you play E4, do you think that Kasparov's E4 is a better move? <laughs> and I said, and I said, well, actually, I do. I say, yeah, that's what I thought. That's all. That's all nonsense, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so he had a very original way of looking at chess. And uh, you mentioned in, in the email that you also have some some good perspective to share on Korchnoi. Korchnoi, yeah. Well, he was um, the good. The good thing about Korchnoi, or the, the special thing, was that he had this incredible frankness. He couldn't lie uh, and he was very he could be very harsh on people but he didn't mind if you um if you were harsh on him he, he, he would tell you something about a certain person and say well this or that and, and they say yeah but but listen w- w- in this or that situation you yourself you you actually did the same and then he would chew on it and i say yes Oh, that's right. <laughs> and, but he was, he, was, he was very open, and he was a fascinating person, his, the, the, the fight that he had uh, uh, against the, 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 the Soviets and, uh, well, the way he wanted to speak about that. Um, he was actually, well, somebody who made it clear to me that I was onto something with, with, with these interviews because he... He was one of the first people that I interviewed. And uh, I started doing that because I, I had done an interview with um, with a big book collector, which I'd done out of my interest in, in chess history. Uh, I, it, 
wasn't my plan to to do interviews with chess players. But then I was listening to this gentleman, and he and he was answering all my questions. And I thought that's amazing. He doesn't he doesn't even think why should I answer this young man? He, he just answers. So maybe some of these chess stars they will do the same. And I first did an interview with uh, Ljubojevic, and um, which which was. Uh, a very dynamic interview because he was moving around all the time, jumping up. Half of it he was doing standing. <laughs> and um, and then I asked Korchnoi, and he kept telling me stories. And uh, after, it was, we had been talking for a long time. Then suddenly his wife came. He says, Victor, what's, what's happening? Are we going to go for dinner or what? And he said, well, just a couple more questions. She says, Really? And he says, yeah, I want my interview to be at least as long as the one of Lyubo. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, this is good. This is good. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then you realize that because at, at the time it was very unusual for people to be interviewed for a longer time. And uh, you could see that some of them, I remember Smyslov, he, re- he thoroughly enjoyed it. Because it, for some reason, it was the kind of attention that he never got. Uh, and, and I mean, if he was interviewed in, in, in Russia, it was mostly about chess. But I wanted to speak about other things, about his religion, about his singing. And he was telling stories about how Enrico Caruso, the, the legendary tenor, had appeared in his dreams and how he had given him singing lessons because he, 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 was, a, he was a beautiful singer, as Miss Love. So at some point, I said, okay, that was it. He said, really? I was enjoying it so much. Uh, <laughs> and that, of course, that, that was a luxury to, uh, to have these people. And I was very fortunate that some of these older champions that I still had the opportunity to, um, to, to speak to them, like, like Botwinnik. I mean, now he's, he's been dead for so many years, but uh, in his final years, I, I met him a couple of times and could interview him and I thought that was absolutely amazing just to uh, to meet both winning yeah and that one is in the day that Bobby Fisher died as well um, or sorry that's, that's not the name of the book finding finding Bobby Fisher <laughs> yeah yeah I think I think I interviewed him three times and then and met, met him a couple of more times but, but the great thing with what Winnick was that he um, people were afraid of him because he uh, he had this very stern look and uh, he there was very little expression in his face. And so everyone was, was afraid. And the first time I met him, it was actually Gena Suzonko who was translating because he, but when he spoke a bit of German, a bit of English, but not enough for, uh, for a real conversation. And at some point he, he was saying something and, uh, and he said, well, and it, it, it was about the building of the central chess club in Moscow. There was a dispute about it. And, he said, but okay, this, in fact, this goes back till the time of uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace. But of course, the young man has not read War and Peace. And I said to again, I said, well, please tell Mr. Botwinning that the young man has read War and Peace. So, okay, so what does the young man think of War and Peace? I said, well, I thought an absolutely fantastic book, but the epilogue was way too long. And <laughs> And then he was silent for a couple of seconds and he smiled and he said, I fully agree. And then <laughs> from that moment onwards, whenever we met, he was, he was accessible. He wanted to talk and it, it was nice. It, uh, actually, it just pops in, up in my, in my head that when, I, when, I, when, he, when he came to the West for the first time after many years, because he, hadn't been, well, he had been there before, of course, but he, then for many years he didn't come. And he was invited to come to Brussels and he was giving a press conference and I was standing there. And in fact, my image of Botwinnik was very, to a large extent, was determined by what Donner, our great writer, had written about him when he saw him in 1946 at the Groningen tournament after the war. And he described all the players as total giants. He says, oh, he was four meters and then uh, there was Botwinnik. Okay, Botwinnik, he was a bit smaller, but still close to three meters. And which, of course, was total nonsense or exaggerate, uh, well, exaggerated quite a bit. But 
for some reason, I had this idea that Botwinnik too was some sort of a giant, which of course he was not. So he's sitting there and I'm, I'm, I'm watching him and Tony Miles is standing next to him. And I said, Tony, I thought, I thought he was much taller. And Tony had a f- fantastic sense of humor. He said, I thought he was exactly like this. <laughs> and I, thought that was, I thought that was great. But yeah, meeting Bot Winning, I, I, I find very special. Well, you describe him as intimidating, but to me, uh, Korchnoi is the one who I would be terrified to talk to. What, did you find him intimidating? No, not, not, not at all, because you, he was, in fact. But, but you, as soon as you understood that you could say anything to him as well, I mean, he, he accepted that, that you talk back. And, uh, of course, in, in the later years of his career, there was this, um, this ritual, which, which, was, which was painful, but at the same time, it was fantastic to watch because he would, he would lose games occasionally, and then he would start insulting his opponents. Um, and, in fact, your game wasn't over before you had been insulted. So uh, I remember being in Plovdiv at the European Team Championships, and and he's he's playing against Shirov, and Shirov is winning, and so at some point Korchnoi resigns, and he he gets up and he's getting his his things that he always carrying with him together, and Shirov he also gets up, but he doesn't walk away because he knows he's not ready yet, and then at some point. Indeed, Korchnoi turns to him and he starts telling him that he is played like an idiot or whatever. And he starts <laughs> insulting him. And Shirov listens and he nods. And then Korchnoi walks away and Shirov knows the moment is there and he just collapsed laughing because you know, <laughs> he knew this was coming. You know, Yeah, there are so many famous stories like that, but they're still funny. I mean, again, I don't feel like they would be... It's good that he had a sense of humor, Shirov, but I would even playing him would be intimidating, obviously, and you dread, or I would, dread the interaction <laughs> after the game. But then his, his, his passion for the game was so immense. Uh, I mean, he, the way he, he punished himself if he, if he f- thought he hadn't played well, I mean, when he was, I mean, he, he had been such a successful player, won so much, and then he loses a game in a manner that was unacceptable to him, and he would just not have dinner. He would think, "Okay, I'm going to my room. I'm going to study. Wow. I'm going to study end games because I didn't deserve dinner." And then, and then he was, I don't know, maybe in his sixties or something. And, uh, so his his, his uh, dedication was total. It was uh, yeah, that's intense. Wow. <laughs> Um, so we had a, a request from a Patreon supporter of the podcast, if, whether you have any Ivanchuk stories, of course, uh, legendary Ukrainian eccentric genius. Ivanchuk is always a topic of much intrigue. Yeah, yeah, that, that's funny because well, we were talking about Nydorf and then he, uh, he's, talk, well, he, he's giving his assessment of all the, the players. And, uh, and at some point he says, of course, you know who the greatest genius is. That's Ivanchuk. And then he immediately adds, but he's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Ivanchuk is not, is not uh, crazy. Uh, but he, he often gives people this idea that he's uh, living on his own planet and that he, um, he's totally lost in thought and, and, and not in touch with reality. And that's sometimes, sometimes he is, but most of the time he's very much in control. And I once asked him, I said, uh, Fazili, this, this morning, I mean, you, you passed me and you totally ignored me. You, you just stared ahead and uh, shook your head. And I said, I think you, defi- you, you, you saw me. There was no question about that. You just didn't want to say, you didn't, just didn't want to talk, which is okay. He says, yes, of course. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, there was... <laughs> No argument about that, of course. That, that, right, that, right. That's, that's how he used his his craziness. But because the, the good thing with Ivanchuk was that he um, he was he was very much he, 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 well, he is very popular uh, with all chess fans. 
I mean, people come to a tournament. Um, for instance, when he was at the Linares tournaments, there, there was no one who was as popular as Ivanchuk. Uh, he would, uh, these kids, they would come for autographs at the start of the round. And Ivanchuk, he would be patient with all of them and, and, and give them autographs. He would invite them to his room to come and play checkers. He, uh, one, in one tournament, that my room was next to his, and then there would be four or five kids there playing checkers with uh, Ivanchuk. Uh-huh. And there was another occasion when he went to a bullfight in uh, Linares, or I think it was in, in, in Ubeda. And, he, and the people recognized him. And then all the people in the arena, they started chanting Ivan Shuk, Ivan Shuk. Wow. So that's, that's how popular he, he, he was very, well, is very loved by, by, let's say, the average chess fan. So one, um, one of these Linares tournaments, it, it's, I mean, the tournament is over and I, I don't recall who, who won, but I'm standing outside the hotel with uh, Kasparov and we're just talking about the tournament or whatever. And um, the uh, the kids, they were not very happy with Kasparov there because he he, want, he would not pause when he came to the round and, and, and sign autographs. I mean, maybe he would do that afterwards, but he, he would just, he, he would take a, a different route through the kitchen so that he avoided these kids. So we're standing there and then a couple of these kids, they come and they have these programs and they say uh, firma firma i mean they were not very polite they were very pushy and uh, and then kasparov looks at them and he says i'm i'm talking you know i have a conversation you not now please go mm-hmm. so they they step back and they they look at him with this with the defiant look and then they say ivan chuk ivan chuk <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was extremely funny, really hilarious. How did Kasparov react? Oh, I, he didn't like that. No, of course. <laughs> but um, yeah, so so no, Ivan Chuki. I think well, he's he's a mystery to many people, and which is actually a bit of a pity because he's a very intelligent guy. He is very well read. Um, I recall that when. I mean, these days, Murakami, he's, he's world famous and everyone yeah. knows his n- novels. The first person who told me about Murakami was, uh, was Ivanchuk. And uh, he, uh, that was really the first time I heard about him. So he, w- he was always uh, reading a lot and, uh, yeah, very broad interest in all kinds of uh, things. Somehow with the Ivanchuk's legendary creativity and imagination, it's not surprising he's a Murakami fan. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed, indeed. They, they, so, but he, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's actually one of my favorite chapters in the, in the book that I wrote about Linares is about uh, Ivanchuk. And the, the, the day that he walks into the restaurant and he, he wants to sit in Kasparov's chair briefly to... Uh, well, to absorb his powers. So, uh, I mean, everyone in the in this restaurant in Linares had a, had a, had a fixed table, and, and you you simply knew, okay, you're not going to sit at this table because that is the table of Anand, or that is the table. And Kasparov, he had his own table. So eventually, he walks in, and Kasparov's table is still empty, and he is in this dreamy state, and he walks over to Kasparov's table, and he makes it clear that he's going to sit down. So one of the waiters comes and says, uh, Ivanchuk, this is Kasparov's table, please go. And he says, no, 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 just, just a second, just a second. And he sits down in the chair. And at that moment, Kasparov's mother walks in, Clara, and she sees what's happening. And she walks over to Ivanchuk with her uh, hand over her brow like, like, like a red Indian, you know. It's spying for him, and, so, mm-hmm. and she walks up, and and, and she and she says, well, "So, what are you doing here?" And and then Ivanchuk explains, and he says, um, "Well, I just want to absorb his powers for uh, maybe, maybe it helps me." And then something amazing happens that um, Clara says, uh, "It's okay, you sit here, you have your lunch here," <laughs> and 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 she asks for another table, 
So wow. so Kasparov comes in and, and she just waves at him, says, come sit here. I thought that was totally amazing. But, uh, but it's a typical Ivanchuk story. Amazing. Wow. <laughs> uh, the legend grows. <laughs> okay. And then you haven't even heard him sing. He, he, he could sing. Uh, once we were traveling back in the middle of the night from Linares to Madrid, and then Ivanchuk started singing Russian folk songs in, Kaspar in Karpov's voice. And, well, let's say everyone collapsed laughing because it was so incredibly well done. And uh, he, he had had a training session with Karpov, so he knew his voice very well. And then he started singing these children's songs uh, with uh, Karpov's voice, which was extremely funny. So uh -huh. yeah, many-sided person. <laughs> Great stuff. Okay, so so Dirk Jan, I want to hear also about the your interviews with uh, Kasparov and Kramnik on the day that uh, Kramnik defeated Kasparov. But first, uh, let's take a break and hear from our friends at uh, aimchess.com. This episode is brought to you in part by aimchess.com, a new sponsor with a great new product that collects all your games from Lee Chess and chess.com and gives you reports of what you need to work on. They even have a new free 2020 recap report that gives you an overview of your chess highlights for the year. So it's pretty fun stuff. They have a free version as well as a subscription one. So you should go check out the site, see if you like it. And then if you decide to subscribe, be sure to use the promo code CHESS30. Capitalization does not matter. And that will show them that you came from Perpetual Chess and you liked what you saw. Okay, back to the interview. Check out aimchess.com. Okay, so we are back and we are ready for more stories from uh, legendary journalist Dirk Jantin Gusendam. So let's hear about that infamous day in chess history where the crown is passed after all those years and uh, Grandmaster Kramnik uh, becomes the world champion. Yeah, that, that, well, that was in 2000 in, in London when, well, to the amazement of many people, Kramnik managed to beat... Uh, Kasparov winning two games and drawing all the rest with his uh, famous Berlin defense, which was uh, erected uh, there. And um, yeah, the special thing was, uh, well, let's say at, at a world championship match, you hope to interview the winner. Uh, and in, well, in this case, I had an agreement with Kramnik. I mean, we, we had done an interview at the start of the, uh, the match um, which for me was already memorable because he he had been training for almost a year and he had lost a lot of weight. He looked super, super fit. I mean, we went to, uh, the, the, there was um, an English lord who had uh, um, helped Kramnik. He, he, he had stayed at his home. Um, I think it was close to Wimbledon where normally speaking, uh, young tennis players were staying at this uh, family's home. And he, uh, he had invited uh, Kramnik, and there he had been training a lot, well, f physically as well. So he, he looked in absolutely great shape before that match, and I, I think that definitely also played a big role in his um, success. So after he'd won, we had agreed that I would come to the place where he uh, was staying with his team, and uh, I would bring Jan Timmen because we, we would do an interview and then we would have some food. Uh, but at that time, I had my first mobile phone. Uh, my, my then wife had said, why, why don't you have a mobile phone? And finally, I bought one. So it's my first mobile phone. And uh, I had barely used it. So I, I, I'm going to back to my hotel room and suddenly my phone rings and I, and I cannot even imagine who has my number. So it is Owen Williams, the manager of um, Kasparov. And he says, uh, I understand that um, you would like to speak to Gary. And I'm so surprised by the phone ringing <laughs> that I, I say, well, actually, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and which was a, a very strange uh, moment of, uh, of, of honesty because it simply hadn't crossed my mind. And then, and then I realized that I was saying something incredibly stupid because he said, well, uh, listen, Gary is very disappointed and uh, he doesn't want to speak to, um, to journalists, but he, he, he wants to 
he is ready to speak to Leoncho, uh, Leoncho Garcia, and you. And then I said, okay, okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, well, when does he expect us? And we, I think that was at five or six, six in the evening that I that uh, together with Leoncho we went over to um, to the hotel where um, where Kasparov was staying, and he and it then it dawned on me what a fantastic well what a historically important moment it, it was i mean he's lost this match he walks into the room he's unshaven he well he hasn't had time for that because he's been analyzing his games all day uh, of course he's he's not a not a very happy uh, person and we, and we we get to talk and at some point it becomes clear what he what he expects from us. Of course, he wants us to write about it. And he, suddenly he lights up and he says, um, and wouldn't it be great? Oh, well, he, he says, okay, I have to admit, I lost to this new type of chess, this, uh, I, I think he called it Wall Street uh, chess, the, 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 the new um, modern hmm. uh, approach. And I have to adjust to that, but I want to do that. And wouldn't it be great if we had a rematch? I say yes, it would be fantastic. That's just one uh, one little snack, Gary. You insisted on having the rematch clause out of the contract. It's <laughs> not it's not something I thought of of anyone. I mean, you insisted on that. So so how do you expect to get a rematch now? He says yes, yes, but that doesn't matter. I mean, wouldn't it be great to have this match? I say well, nobody cares if it's interesting. I mean, may- maybe maybe it helps, but. Uh, but I'm afraid it's going to be very difficult. And of course, it proved very difficult and it never never took place. So we, we had that talk. And then I had to get to the place where Kramnik was staying. And um, and I was, I was planning to, well, of course, I wanted to write about these, these two, two moments uh, combined. So at, at Kramnik's place, we, um, well, we had the interview. And then... Uh, there was this moment that, that he said, okay, so that was that. Now it's time to have some food. And he asked Miguel Ieska, all the others they had left, they, they, they had gone out for dinner. He was there with uh, Bereev and Loche and, uh, and Ieska, he, he ordered a table of food for all of us. And um, we were just having fun. And at, at that point, um, uh, I was... I was well, that's a long time. I was still smoking occasionally. And I said, well, in fact, I feel like a cigarette. And Jan Timani said, yeah, I could I could do with a cigarette. And then Kramnik, who hadn't been smoking for a year and who had worked on his physical condition, said, well, yeah, I think this is a good moment to start again. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was that was idiotic. And... Um, but he, he he was very well. He, he was very attached to smoking. It was one of the things that he uh, he really loved. And l- later, he would go to his doctor, and his doctor would say, "Well, it would be good if you quit smoking." And then he said, "Then how long will it take me for my lungs to be clean again?" He says, five years." So then I can start again. He says, "Okay, I'll, I'll mark that in my diary." But he was serious. He did that. So he didn't smoke for five years, and then he started again. And, uh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but that, I, I was absolutely amazed because he looked so fit at that point that he just, within a second, he started smoking again. Yeah, yeah. Well, well-deserved. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you could beat Kasparov. <laughs> Uh, I've never been a smoker, but by all no, means, no. Have a no, no. it's it's way better not to smoke. So that I'm very happy that I haven't done that for a long time. But of course, these these are these historical moments that, in fact, I was very well happy. Or, or happy. Well, it's 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 the wrong word. But last year, when Kramnik quit chess, that he did that in the Netherlands, and actually he came to my place that evening or that day. So I didn't know that was going to happen. He was going to play a simul in Parliament here in The Hague. And we had agreed that before that time we would go to, to the museum because he wanted to see some Rembrandts. And at some point he arrives at my place and he walks into 
the door and he shows his phone and he says, what do you think about the first sentence? I think, what, what is this about? And it just says, and it, it is his press release that he's quitting chess. I said, wow, okay. <laughs> so uh, I thought that we might briefly speak about the tournament or, or something, but it was clear that uh, that was not going to happen. But what I, what I found fascinating was to see that he sends out this message to the world that he's quitting chess and who are the first people to react. I could see that firsthand. But, um, I think Fishy Island was the first one who sent him a text message. And then there was one from Kayakin and there were some others. But I, I find that fascinating to, um, to sit there at the table and to watch his phone. And then whenever there was a buzz to see and say, yeah. who, who is it? And, and then we agreed that, that we should have um, an interview. And I think the next week I went to Geneva where he lives to, uh, to do the interview there. Wow, but, amazing uh, to be present for so much chess history. Yeah, that's a privilege. That's a privilege, and 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 it's it's something that yeah. Sometimes you you realize that, and 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 it's it's really nice. Uh, before we let you go, Dirk Jan, any other any last stories that rival that one? I mean, I know you have uh, infinite stories, but is there any anything else that you place on that pedestal? Well, there, there, there's 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 many. I mean, there's it's 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 funny because obviously. I expected you to ask for some some in interview highlights, and then, but then I, I thought, well, I, I have two books which are well, yeah. for me are mainly highlights, and, and and there's some fifty of them, and and then there's several unpublished ones. So it's you just mention a name, and I'll tell you. And, uh, it's uh, <laughs> no, it, it because I was I was very fortunate to to speak to so so many people, and also from the older generation that uh, some people that are no longer with us like uh, Larson or uh, well, Smith Okay, let's hear about Larson and then we'll, we'll call it an interview. <laughs> well, Larson was very special because he, um, he yeah, well, he, he, was, he was a fascinating guy. But, but it's, it's funny because you, well, you, you mentioned what, what Gena wrote about uh, Bronstein, but uh, in his later years, uh, Larson had something similar that he he could go on and on and on and on, and at some point, um, but the f the first time uh, I interviewed him, uh, I was very impressed, and I I hadn't done many interviews, but I thought Larson is playing in this tournament, and I'm staying there. It was a tournament in um, in Brussels, and I I had prepared in a very silly manner i just I, I just had an awful long list of questions because i wanted <clears throat> to ask him uh, so much but then i approached him and i said um would you be ready to give an interview and he said oh yeah yeah no, no problem at all call me any day between midnight and three in the morning <laughs> <laughs> and i said well that's and I'm mostly sleeping. And he said, yeah, well, but that's the time you would be able to interview me. So uh, at some point I prepared for that, and I I, uh, I gave him a call around midnight, and uh, he said, yeah, come over. But he was, it, for me, it was very intimidating because he was sitting on a chair in the middle of the room, and there was very bad lighting in that room. And he said, uh, well, okay, you ask your questions. And I had, I had the feeling that it didn't go well at all. And I just kept asking these questions. And, uh, and then later I listened back and it wasn't that bad, but it, was, it wasn't brilliant either. So years later, I, had, I, I didn't use this, but I, then I, I had a second session with him when I had gotten to know him. And, and, and that was very helpful. But, um, but then we... We sometimes also had dinner at tournaments, and uh, because we shared many interests, the uh, chess literature, politics, whatever. Um, but at the end of such an evening, you would be pre pretty tired because Bent Larsen went on and on and on and on. <laughs> and 
one person who had experience with that was Nigel Short because he had had uh, Ben Larson as a second. And he had told me that at some point he he just was afraid. <laughs> and and he, he would sneak out of bed very early in the morning just to have some time for himself. <laughs> so, so he went into the kitchen and, he, and, and Nigel was having some breakfast. And he thought, my, my moment of peace, just alone, here, now. And then Larson, he already enters the, 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 the kitchen and says, right. good, good morning. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so one, at one of these tournaments, I think it was in, in Prague, we were going for dinner with a big group. And we're walking into the restaurant and Larson, uh, yeah, he, we had had dinner the night before and he walks over uh, and it's, it's clear that he, he wants to continue our conversation. At that point, Nigel Short, he walks up to me and I said, Dekian, you got a second, I want to ask you something. And he takes me aside and he whispers in my ear, he says, I saved you there. <laughs> come and sit at come and sit at our table. <laughs> wow, it's it's funny. I mean, this is such a legend who so many chess fans would be like dying to spend a minute oh, with. Oh yeah, yeah, you know. No, that no, that that's that that's what I mean. I I, I was thinking about this the other day, and then I, I, I and of course it 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 was. I, I mean, I loved spending time with him because he was a fascinating person and uh, fantastic uh, player. And then you you realize that there were moments when you thought, oh well, not today, you know, and and, and now you think you you would pay to, right. be, to be back at the table with uh, Ben Larson because he was obviously. I mean, it's it, if it sounded disrespectful, that was definitely not my. I, I I just wanted to show that yeah, even these greats they have their human sides, you know, their quirks. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, well, Dirk Jan, this has been amazing. Um, hopefully we can do a part two someday. I know that you've got so many stories that, that our guests would love to hear. And of course, someday I'd like to hear a bit more about what you alluded to in terms of how you weren't originally planning to do chess interviews. So I, I'd love to hear how you uh, got in a position to just accumulate these amazing stories. So um, hopefully we can, we can come back to that someday, but I want to thank you for your time. And uh, this has been fantastic. It was my pleasure, Ben, and uh, any time. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, and of course, New in Chess Magazine listeners, hopefully you already know about it, but uh, just um, not, not much I can say that hasn't already been said, but the, one of the best ways to keep up with modern chess and just get incredible analysis and puzzles and uh, life perspective and, and uh, all that stuff. Um, so you can go to New in Chess Magazine's website and uh, check, out, check out what they offer. Thank you, Ben. That's very kind. All right. That's the least I can say. Uh, have, have a good day, Dirk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, as always, to my producer, Matthew Passy, and to everyone who helps spread the word about the show, telling your friends, writing positive reviews on podcast platforms. All of that stuff helps. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at BennyFisher1. Join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group. You can find the link on the website. And we are back in action on Instagram, at Perpetual Chess, sharing a weekly clip from the podcast. So follow us over there as well. But of course, the main purpose of these credits is to thank everyone who makes the show possible by their financial support. Without you all, Perpetual Chess would have ceased to exist a long time ago. And for that, I am forever grateful and work to continually improve and expand the offerings from Perpetual Chess. So without further ado, I would like to give extra special thanks to the following people and entities. Chessable.com, David Lazarus of LazmanChess.com, Quality Chess Books, The Capital City Chess Club, The Abysmal Deaths of Chess Blog, Adapta Interactive Web Designs and Services, The Apprentice Twitch Channel, Andrew Alharji, Andrew Bach, Anidi Deer, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, The Charlotte Chess Center, The Chess Central's Chess Blog, ChessMood.com, Chris Flanagan, Chris Lott, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel He, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber, Derek Jones, I am Dimitri Schneider, I am Eric Rosen, Eric Tam, Ewan Richardson, Farhan Thawar, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Glenn Downing, Greg Harfs, Greg Shahadi, Gregory Gulick, Guven Manet, 
James Kennedy, Jeff Martinson, Jens Green, Jeremy Nielsen, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John Cromarty, John Mar- MacArthur, Kelly Palmer, Kevin O'Callaghan, King Selt, Lucio Casada Silva, the law offices of Stuart Katz, Matthew Feeney, Michael Can, FM Michael Oblin, Mike Zelazny, Mr. Mike Shahadi, the famous Mr. Dodgy, the Nerd Nays Twitch channel, Peter Sodi, the Playmore Chess Academy of the Hampton Chess Club, Reuven Fisher, the Seattle Chess Club, Shane Unger, Stephen Kelty, Stephen Martinez, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryan of StrongChess.com, Todd Kennedy, the Vintage Patsers, which is a Chess.com improver group, Wayne Beam, William Hogarth, Aaron Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Payhouse, FM Andre Terokov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Barry Hessian, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Bruce Scott, Brian Tillis of Palm Beach Chess, Chad Hilton, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Wayne Scott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explain, Coach J's Chess Academy, Corey Budson, Costa Chorus, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsburg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Bleskacek, David Brown, David Hamblin, David Cramley, Dalen Shelton, Dennis Parrish, Dirk Decker, FM Donnie Ariel, Douglas Matthew, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Emmanuel Langlois, Robitai, Ethan Smith, Hallelujah Cat, Ian Mason, Indrick Ryland, Felipe Melo Pereira, Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Latart Lavoie, Dr. Frank Tortoris, Frank Zananis, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gene Stewart, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Han Schut, Harish Renivasan, Howard Vihan, Jacob Kovacs, Jacob Turan, Jacques Perry, James Espinwall, James Banastia, James Muir, Jason Willem, J.J. Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Hoyland, Jerry Wells, Jim Ratliff, John Tully, Juan Almaguer, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurty, Jonathan Slater, John Tully, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, WGM Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, Grandmaster Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Kevin Boyce, Kevin Pryor, Kior Gada of the Lakeshore Chess Club, I am Kostya Kavutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Ryforth, Laura Boyovsky, Macaulay Peterson, Mark Miller, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matthew Passy, Matthew Tedesco, Matthias Plock, the Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Miguel Araspidi, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Salon, Neil Bruce, Nigmat Malajanov, Nicholas Isabel, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Randy Tempo, Ricky Grijalva, Richard Hallenbuck, Robert Tichi, Robert Turner, Rory Coleman, Rory Yearwood, Ryan Berg, the Say Chess YouTube channel, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Sebastian Finsterwater, Walder, Shane Unger, the Sil- Silver Knights in Richmond, Stefan Roller, WGM Tatia of Abrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tom Edsel, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Vishnu Srikumar, William H. Brock, William Juniper, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of of chess1000.com and of course Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks for listening everyone. We will be back next week with another episode of Perpetual Chess.